reading this morning from the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians and chapter 1, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and chapter 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into his, the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Turn again to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. 
For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Apostle Paul is uh, speaking here about the great central concern and conviction that he had as a minister, not only as a minister, but as, as a Christian man. And he's contrasting his own activity here with the activity of Jews and Greeks. Jews demand signs, he says. Greeks search for wisdom. That really was their main interest and concern. Uh, but, he says, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. So unlike the Jews, whose primary interest was in signs and wonders, and unlike the Greeks, whose interest was in wisdom, human wisdom, our, our concern, our interest, he says, is in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that preached, proclaimed, we preach Christ crucified. So obviously then we need to recognize what is the central meaning and message of the cross. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, you will have noticed, I'm sure, how they're dominated by what we call the Passion Narratives, those closing sections of the Gospels. And in every aspect of the Gospels, as you read them carefully, you find that they're all leading towards and directing you towards the Passion Narratives. And then those Passion Narratives take up, in, some, in one instance, half of the gospel itself. And throughout, the Lord Jesus is preparing his disciples for his passion, and they climax in the cross and in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then if you look at the early preaching of the church, you see that it is the cross that the apostles were preaching about. You've taken him by wicked hands and have crucified and slain, but God raised him from the dead. That was their central theme. Always that is what they preached. And then the letters of the New Testament, those letters uh, repeatedly explain the centrality of the cross. Here in this chapter, the Apostle Paul says in verse 17, for example, Christ did not send me to baptize, baptism, that wasn't the central part of Paul's ministry, he says. Uh, he's not undervaluing baptism by saying that. He's not undermining it. But he's saying he did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He's not undervaluing baptism when he says that. But his work was to preach, he says, the gospel. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. And then later on in chapter 2, and verse 2, he says, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When you think about baptism, uh, what, what, what is it? Well, Scripture says it is baptism into his death. That's what it symbolizes most eloquently and so powerfully. And in a few moments, we will be gathering around the Lord's table and partaking of the Lord's Supper. Why do we do that? Well, it's in order to remember the Lord's death, the cross. So throughout the New Testament, we find that the cross is central, it is dominant. And actually, the, the language of the cross has come into our everyday language and speech. We speak of something as being the crux of the matter or of being crucial to a particular argument. And those words, crux and crucial, they come from the Latin word for the cross, crux. So everyday speech also is acknowledging the central significance of the cross of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we use those words, we're saying in a sense, just as the cross is central to the Christian gospel and the Christian faith, so this point is central to my argument, it stands or falls at this point, and Christianity stands or falls at the cross. When we speak about the cross, then we're talking about something central. And when we're talking about the cross, we're talking about the death of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is his death that saves. Paul is telling us that in verse 24. He says, it is the power of God and the wisdom 
of God, the power of God that saves us, the wisdom of God that reveals his purposes and his plans to us. So it is the death of Jesus that saves us, not his incarnation, not the Sermon on the Mount, not the concept of liberty. At the heart of all those things, great and important truths though they are, lies this one great and central truth, the death of Jesus Christ. He was incarnate in order that he might die. The Sermon on the Mount is only possible to live in the light of the Sermon on the Mount by those who know the graces of the Holy Spirit in their life because Jesus has died for them. And liberty, liberty is only possible through the cross. So all of these other truths of the gospel that are so great and wonderful actually only find their significance in the cross. Now we need to ask why that is. Why is the cross of Christ so crucial? And there are two answers to that question. The first is because of the fact of our sins. That's the basic human problem, you see, sin. And if you want a basic definition of sin, then I suppose you'd struggle to find a clearer definition than is given by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 59 of his prophecy in verse 2. Your iniquities, he says, have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That is a definition of sin, a Bible definition. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you and he will not hear. God doesn't hear you because of your sins, he says. He's not listening to you. He doesn't hear. You say your prayers, he's not even interested. He's not even listening. And it matters not, you see, how religious a man might be or a woman. Uh, all of our religious activity, all of our religious observance is totally irrelevant as far as God is concerned. He's not interested in any of that. He hears you pray and perhaps frequently and perhaps very eloquently. And others may hear you pray and others may listen and they may be impressed. But he doesn't. He's not interested. Not in the slight bit, bit interested. Why? Why is that? Sin. Your sins have forced a separation between you and your God, and he will not hear, says the prophet. God will not hear our prayers if there are sins in our lives that are left undealt with. He won't. We may pray movingly, and we may pray eloquently before others, and with tears, but God will not hear them. Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. He hides his face. Now that's sin. That is the basic human problem and predicament. The world at large, of course, doesn't think like that. The world will dismiss the very notion of that and ridicule the whole idea of sin. And it will say that our real problem as human beings is a lack of education or a lack of proper housing or poverty, uh, social deprivation. It'll use all kinds of reasoning like that. But the Bible tells us the basic problem of human beings is Sin. Sinfulness. And not one of us here is free of it. All have sinned, the scripture says. All fall short of the glory of God. Now most people, as I say, don't see it like that. They don't see that they're sinners. They don't think that they're separated from God. Men and women today still will speak, won't they, about the essential goodness of man. It's... Uh, Hard to believe that they will do that, but they will do that in spite of the bodies that littered Europe and the East during the last century in two world wars. They'll say that in spite of the atrocities being perpetrated today throughout the Middle East. It's incredible but people still speak about the goodness of man in spite of the unspeakable cruelty and the spiraling crime, the selfishness. The child abuse, the bitterness, the violence, the envy, the greed, the jealousy, the drug abuse, 
mass hunger and deprivation in the majority of the world's population while we live in gross materialism people still talk about the essential goodness of human nature politicians still do and we'll be tempted to pat ourselves on the back and tell each other that we are after all good folk people just don't see that we are actually basically self-centered and selfish and we've forgotten God and that's why so many people are as they are today they have completely forgotten God they're ignorant of God but the Bible confronts us with God as he really is a holy just creator sustainer and judge of all the earth a God to whom we are responsible to whom every one of us one day will come and to whom we must give an account. And it commands us to obey the Lord, to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, and therefore there is nothing more important that we should understand that we are separated from him and we are under his wrath. Now that's perfectly plain. There's no way really that we can be unsure about that and uncertain of it. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in, in Rome, uh, says that the wrath of God, that is God's hostility towards sin, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. That is the very first truth of the gospel that we're all under the wrath of God and that he is implacably against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. And if ever a person is to become a Christian, that's the first truth of the gospel that they must come to terms with. It wasn't only the Apostle Paul who speaks like this, but our Lord Jesus also speaks like this. Just remember these words of the Lord Jesus in Mark's Gospel in chapter 9. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Those are our Lord's words. That's Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, speaking to sinners. So the judgment of God against sin... His wrath is real. It's real now. It will be real then. Think of the words of our Lord in John's Gospel, chapter 3. This is the condemnation, he said, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. He's speaking there about God's judgment on sin now. This is the judgment of God. We see it all around us in the world today. People have become blind to the truth. They do not believe. They cannot see. And they don't care. That's an expression of the judgment of God. And if that's true now, it's going to be true in the future too. Only more so. So the cross of Jesus is absolutely essential and crucial because of the fact of your sin and mine, the sin of man, the fact of sin. Then the second reason why the cross is crucial is because of the love of God. The love of God. The amazing and astonishing thing, you see, is that God should love people like that. People who are actually under his wrath. Those who have been separated from God by their iniquities and their sins. He, nevertheless, has loved people like that. He is love, essentially. And his love has been shown to us in that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for the ungodly. That is the expression of the love of God. 
God so loved the world, this unrighteous world, this ungodly world, that he gave his only begotten Son. And so the cross of Christ is crucial because of the love of God towards sinners. And we might not think of God uh, in that way. We might be tempted, you see, to think of God as a stern judge. We might be tempted to think of Jesus Christ as having to intervene in order to save us from this angry God, as though God were unyielding and unwilling to save us. That isn't how the Bible describes the situation at all, as if the Son is displeased with the Father's wrath and deplores it and therefore wants to save us from it. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Scriptures tell us that God the Father has loved us. The Father has loved us, as does the Son. He's not this stern, inflexible judge that some might make him out to be. He's the God who has himself loved us. It is the Father who has sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world, says the Apostle John. And by the same token, if we are not to think of the Father as this stern, inflexible judge who's reluctant to save us and whom, from whom the Son steps in to save us, it's equally important that we don't think of God as some kind of easygoing, grandfather type of figure who just overlooks and ignores our sins. You might be tempted to do that with your children, and particularly with your grandchildren. I know all about that. But it can be quite wrong to do that. If our children are wrong, do we always overlook the wrong? If our grandchildren are wrong, do we always overlook their wrongdoing? I hope not. Surely when our children do something that is plainly wrong, we expose that. We forgive it as they are sorry for it. And it leads them on to a right kind of living. That's what God does with us, you see. He will not overlook our sin. He won't turn a blind eye to it. He doesn't push it aside and say, oh, that doesn't matter. Because it does matter. It is an offence to him. It is a direct challenge to his sovereignty and his very being and God, as God. And because God is just and because God is holy he will always deal with sin it'll always be dealt with it will always be punished the question is where will it be punished so in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary God has shown his willingness to save sinners he's willing to save us but only by means of this cross so at the cross we see the love of God his mercy and his justice perfectly blending together in one that is why jesus came he came into the world in order to die for sinners that's why he took human nature jesus didn't take human nature you see just to ennoble it or to glorify it or to show us how important human nature is he didn't take human nature just to give us an example of how we should live no, the reason why he took human nature to himself was in order that he might die in our stead. That's the primary reason why the Lord Jesus became a man. It was that he might die. He, and he could not die in any other way other than by taking human nature to himself. That's the reason why he became a man. Listen to what the writer to the Hebrews tells us. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that we might, by the grace of God, that he might, by the grace of God, taste death for every man. That's why he took human nature, that he might experience death in our stead. He continues like this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So he's saying Jesus did not come in order to show us what it meant to live as a man, a proper man. He came in order to die, and to die in such a way 
that he turned away the wrath of God from sinful men and women. And God is able, therefore, to forgive us because of the death of Jesus. You see, though you are to repent, and the gospel calls you to repent, God does not forgive you because you repent. And though we are to pray, and God calls us to pray, God doesn't forgive us because we pray. And though we are to offer our lives to God in wholehearted service, God doesn't forgive us because we serve him. No. If God were to do that, then he would be forgiving us for things that we do. Of course we need to repent, and we need to pray, and we need to serve and offer our life in service to God. But we are never saved because of those things. We are forgiven, we are saved because of the cross, because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in our place. It's the cross that takes the sins of man away. It is the cross that brings the love of God to our hearts. So the cross is crucial, and it's crucial because of the fact of our sins and because of the fact of the love of God towards sinful men and women. Now let me just briefly tell you about the effect that the cross has on us. And I'll simply explain some of the great words that the New Testament uses to describe the effect of the cross upon us. The Bible speaks about redemption. Redemption. It's a wonderful word, to be redeemed. We need to be redeemed because we are slaves. And uh, we are in bondage because of our sin. And we're in bondage because of our ignorance and confusion and frustration and futility and death. And Christ has come to redeem us out of that bondage to sin and futility and death. He's come to redeem us. Where are people? What are people like before they become Christians? Well, it's as if we're imprisoned in a dungeon. Prisoners and slaves in the darkness and the gloom of a dungeon, awaiting execution and in chains. But then, even though they're not aware of it, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, redeems them. He pays a price for their release from that dungeon. He dies in their place. He's executed instead of them, and he dies. And then he rises, and it's as if he comes to the prison cell and flings open that door and breaks the chain and leads them out to freedom. It's redemption. We are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, and therefore we have freedom. The Bible uses the word propitiation. To propitiate means to turn away anger by, the, by an act of sacrifice. To turn anger away through a sacrifice. Now God's anger, God's wrath is very real. As I said earlier, God's wrath is being poured out upon sin and against sin. And it will be poured out upon sin in the last and the great day of the Lord, because God is holy and just and righteous. And God has poured out that wrath upon the Lord Jesus Christ for us and instead of us, so that as the Lord Jesus Christ is upon the cross, God pours his wrath on him, and in that way it is turned away from us. He takes it upon himself. So the wrath of God is taken away and removed, and and now the Christian knows only the smile and the favour of God because of that great act of propitiation. We know God's favour because his holiness and his justice have been satisfied in the death of Christ on the cross. And propitiation means then God's wrath upon Jesus, God's smile upon us, his people. Or take the word reconciliation. Reconciliation. It implies hostility, doesn't it? That there was hostility between God and us. There was enmity. Very real and true. But Christ removes the enmity. He takes away the cause of the enmity. And the cause of the enmity, of course, is our sins. He purges our sins. But not just our sins. 
Also, this wrath of God that is against sin, he carries that away too, and therefore he makes peace. And having made peace, he preaches peace, so that we actually become the recipients of the message of peace, and peace is given to us, and we enjoy this peace through the redeeming, reconciling work of Christ upon the cross of Calvary. We sing sometimes, don't we, loved with everlasting love, led by grace, that love to know spirit breathing from above thou hast taught me it is so oh this full and perfect peace that's the effect of reconciliation or take the word justification it's a legal term it's a forensic term we face condemnation because of our sins because we are guilty we've broken the law we deserve and we are condemned but our Lord Jesus takes that guilt away through the blood of his cross and he meets all the legal claims that the law places upon us and he's accepted the curse and the condemnation due to us in our place. And because he has taken the condemnation, we are forgiven and we are accepted into God's family. The legal case against us is wiped out and the effect of justification is forgiveness and adoption brought into the family of God. He forgives us and he takes us as his children. Or take the word regeneration. The inward condition of people by their nature as sinners is that they are spiritually dead. The Bible is absolutely clear on that. When Adam sinned, the Holy Spirit left him. And we now are like, as it were, ruined temples in which the Holy Spirit of God once dwelt. You might have sometime visited temples in different parts of the world or at least seen photographs of ruined temples. Well, that's almost like a picture of what human beings are, ruined temples in which the presence of God once dwelt but now no longer. But because of the cross, because of the death of the Lord Jesus and all that that means, the Holy Spirit comes again to dwell within our hearts and lives. He regenerates us. He makes us alive again so that we become the habitation of God through the Spirit. That is regeneration. That's the new birth. And the effect of the new birth is spiritual life and sight and power. So all of these blessings, redemption, which sets us free, propitiation, which which brings about the love of God and the smile of God upon us. Reconciliation that brings us peace with God. Justification that brings forgiveness and then adoption into the family of God. Regeneration which brings about life and sight and power. All of that is ours because of the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross as our substitute. No wonder Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, to minister, and to give his life a ransom instead of many. So the death of the Lord Jesus, the cross of Calvary, doesn't just inspire us. It does that. And it doesn't just give us power to live life after his example. It does that, but it's infinitely more than that. Jesus has come to overthrow evil and to destroy it. He came to bring about reconciliation with God and to set the love of God forever upon his children. So that Paul, when he went around Europe and Asia preaching the gospel, he only had one message. We preach Christ crucified. He could have preached, couldn't he, about the abolition of slavery? Wouldn't that have been a relevant message in the first century Roman Empire, the abolition of slavery? Could have preached about that, but he didn't. He could have preached about social reform and how important that would have been. He could have spoken about the need to end poverty in the empire. He could have spoken about human wisdom. Could have started speaking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Could have started preaching about all manner of things that occupy people's thoughts today. But instead he said, we preach Christ crucified. Crucified. Here is the wisdom. Here is the power of God, he's saying. Of course, it's divine folly to man 
and divine weakness. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And it's through this great message of our Saviour's death upon the cross that we are given the blessings of the gospel. And we're motivated then and inspired to go out and deal with these other lesser matters and concerns that I've already mentioned to you a moment ago. So the cross of Jesus Christ is central. It lies right at the heart of the Christian faith. May we never, never wander from it. May we say always, Jesus, keep me near the cross. And if we are near the cross, well, it will be well with our souls. And we'll know what it is to live and to die triumphantly and victoriously. The Lord bless his word to us this morning. Let's pray. We thank you, our gracious God, for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, in which your power and your wisdom is made manifest. We thank you that through the cross, new and eternal life is given to your people. Your wrath has been propitiated, the enmity removed so that we may be reconciled uh, to you. Our sins have been fully, freely and finally forgiven because of our Saviour's sufferings for us in the cross and we have been redeemed. For these gracious and glorious blessings we give you our thanks this morning. We pray then that the cross would ever be central to our thoughts and to our uh, affections and to our testimony as a local church that we might be pointing men and women and boys and girls to a Saviour crucified for sinners, that they might have eternal life in him. We ask it for his name's sake. Amen. Amen.